In single variable calculus, you hopefully you remember that once you had the derivative, you also talked about the linearization of a function at a point. The linearization of a function f at a point p was the linear function, except now we need to be a little more careful and say affine linear function. Um, the linearization was the affine linear function that best approximated the function f at x values near p. Um, linear approximation is the approximation you get by approximating the value of the function f by its linearization, which is a, supposed to be a much easier function. It's an affine linear function. You start with a complicated function. You want to estimate its values near some point p, and instead you use the linearization, which is an easier function. The, the graph of the linearization in single variable calculus was exactly the tangent line to the graph of f at the point p. Um, what, what do we want to do now in multivariable calculus? The same thing. We, want to, we have a function f. In the last section, we talked about its total derivative at a point p, and we'd like to have linear approximation. We would like to have an affine linear function that approximates the function f well near a point p at which the function is differentiable. Um, then we'll define the tangent set to be the graph of the linearization. And in the case of a two-variable function, we'll have a tangent plane to the graph. Um, and then we'll look at linearization in, in its uh, form where you only worry about the change in the function and the change in the variables. And that gives us differential approximation. So that's what we want to do, basically redoing in, now in multivariables, in many variables, what you hopefully remember doing in one variable before. So um, th throughout this discussion, I'm going to have a function f from Rn to R, or maybe it's not defined on all of Rn, but on some subset of Rn. Um, I'm going to assume f is differentiable at p. So really, I don't need f defined on all of Rn. It needs to be defined on a neighborhood of p, so a subset that contains an open ball around p. Um, assuming this, in the last section, we talked about the total derivative. And the total derivative means that to have a total derivative, to be differentiable, and to have the total derivative d sub p of f exist means that, in fact, the limit as, as the magnitude of h approaches 0 of f of p, p plus h minus f of p minus the value of the total derivative at h, if you take the magnitude of that, and divide by the magnitude of h, that this limit is 0. This is, this is what you get from the definition of the, deriv the total derivative of f at p and differentiability. It tells you that this limit is 0. But the magnitude of h is approaching 0, so this denominator is going to 0. And this fraction is also going to 0, which means that the numerator has to approach 0. In fact, it has to do it kind of faster than the denominator. I won't make that more rigorous, but uh, the more rigorous statement is in the book. Um, but in particular, it means that as the, as the magnitude of h approaches 0, the magnitude of this numerator has to approach 0, which means the quantity inside the absolute value signs has to approach 0. So that what we conclude is that um, the informal statement is when the magnitude of h is close to 0, then f of p plus h minus f of p minus p sub minus the total derivative of f, evaluated h, then this is approximately equal to 0. 
And then we rewrite this in kind of a, in a nicer form. We let, we let x, the vector x, denote p plus h, which means that h is x minus p. And then the magnitude of h being close to 0 is the same as then the magnitude of x minus p being close to 0, which just means x is close to p. And so linear approximation reads like this. Linear approximation if x is close to p, then, okay, you, you rewrite this. Um, f of p plus h is f of x. And I'm going to put these two terms over there. So f of x is approximately equal to f of p. Uh, now I won't have any vector operation. Well, I won't have a vector operation there. So I'm, I'll, I'll um, let me write these as points instead of vectors. If x is close to p, then f of x is approximately f of p plus d sub the total derivative of f of p evaluated at h, but I'll leave vector signs here since I'm doing vector operations, is approximately this. And then we use our formula for the total derivative. The total derivative of f at p is just obtained by dotting with the gradient vector. So our approximation is that f of x is approximately equal to f of p plus the gradient vector of f at p dotted with the vector x minus p. That's linear approximation in general and for any number of variables. Um, it looks a little nicer, a little more down to earth if you just have two variables. So <clears throat> suppose f is just a function of two variables and a point p is in coordinates a, b, then what does linear approximation say? It says if x, y is close to a, b, then f of x, y is approximately equal to f of a, b plus, and now the gradient vector of f dotted with x, y minus a, b, but we can go ahead and expand that dot product since I've only got two things that won't be too cumbersome. It's the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Evaluated at a, b times, uh, times x minus a plus the partial derivative of y evaluated at a, b times y minus b. So that's what linear approximation looks like for a function of two variables. Um, it's in incredibly important. This, the most fundamental mistake that people make in applying this, <clears throat> You apply this at some kind of nice point a, b. So you calculate this side at a nice point a, b, including these partial derivatives, so the gradient vector. This evaluated at a, b. In a, in a problem, we'll do an example in a second, a and b will be fixed numbers. So these will be constants, and that's why this function is so nice. This is a constant, that's a constant, a is a constant. This is a constant, b is a constant. x and y are the only variables, so this is an affine linear function. Over here, it's the most common mistake that people make when using linear approximation is to leave this partial derivative in terms of x and y 
and that partial derivative in terms of x and y and have some god-awful function over here on, on the right. Don't do that. All right, so all right, with that warning, let's go ahead and look at an example. I want, so let me <clears throat> start over here. So as our first example, let's look at f of x, y is 4 plus x minus x squared minus y cubed. And use linear approximation at 1, 1. Estimate F at zero point nine, one point two, and F at one point zero one, one point zero five. All right, so this is what we want to do. Um, <clears throat> all right, we're told to use linear approximation at 1, 1. That means the AB, or the, I think, the point P in the general linear approximation formula, is 1, 1. It's the nice point at which you calculate the affine linear function. Um, you don't leave x's and y's in your answer. And then, for x and y, you put in these point, this point and this point. And those are supposed to be relatively close to 1, 1, like 0 0.9, 1.2. It's kind of close to 1, 1. 1 1.01, 1 1.05 is even closer to 1, 1. And so we should get a reasonable approximation of those by using linear approximation. So what do we need to do? We need, we need f at 1, 1 and the partial derivatives of f at 1, 1. These are, these are numbers that don't have x's and y's in them when you're done. f at 1, 1, you just calculate. It's 4 plus 1 minus 1 minus 1. Uh, so 4 minus 1, so 3. Partial derivative of f with respect to x is 1 minus 2x. Partial derivative of f with respect to y is just minus 3y squared. But we need these evaluated at 1, 1 so that we just have constants. Partial derivative of f with respect to x at 1, 1. You plug in x is 1, y is 1. Well, the y value doesn't matter, so just plug in x is 1. You get 1 minus 2 minus 1. And f sub y at 1, 1, the partial derivative f with respect to y at 1, 1, you plug in x is 1, y is 1, so um, if y, uh, the x value doesn't matter now, but when you plug in y is 1, you get minus 3. Okay, so we've got this, 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 and so what linear approximation tells us, our point is 1, 1, says, if xy is close to 1, 1, then f of xy is close to f of 1, 1, but we just found that was 3 for this example. Um, f sub x at 1, 1 is minus 1. And f sub y at 1, 1 was minus 3. And a is 1 and b is 1. So this is 1 and 1. So we've approximated our original, not too ugly function, but you know, a cubic function by 
this nice affine linear function on the right. So we get 3 minus x minus 1 minus 3 times y minus 1. And then what do you do? You take the x and y values at which you're trying to approximate the f value and you just plug them in this side. I should say that I, I warned you kind of strongly that you need constants here and here. You do not leave the partial derivatives with x's and y's in them. That's the most basic mistake that people make fairly often. Another mistake that's not as awful, it's just a waste of time and messes things up. You don't want to expand these. You don't want to multiply that minus sign through, multiply this minus 3 through, and collect the constant terms. Why not? Because you want these quantities, x minus a and y minus b, to be sitting there, because those should be very close to 0, because x should be close to a and y should be close to b. So you want to leave those quantities grouped the way they are, because they're, um, they should be close to 0 anytime you actually use linear approximation. So <clears throat> what approximation do we get? We want to approximate f at 0.9, um, 1.2. Linear approximation tells us that that's approximately 3 minus. All right, x minus 1. x minus 1 is negative 0.1, negative 0.1. Right, point 0.9 minus 1, and then minus 3 times um, 1.2 minus 1, so that's just 0.2. Right? As I said, you want to leave those quantities grouped that way because these things will come out to be small. So you get the side is 3 plus 0.1 minus 0.6. Um, so we get... Uh, this, this minus 0.5, so 2.5. And we want to approximate f at, I've lost it, f at 1.01, 1.05. And you just plug that in too, so you take f at 1.01. 0, 1, 1.05, and you get that this should be approximately 3 minus, now x minus 1 is minus 0, 0.1, and then minus 3 times 1.05 minus 1, 0. 0, 0.05. So this is 3 minus 0 0.01 minus, minus 0 0.15. So this is 3 minus 0 0.16. So this is 2.84. Um, how close are those? Well, I'll actually have to cheat and look at my actual calculations. But if you actually check the value, um, well, let me start over here. If you actually check the values of this, which you could do by hand since f only involves squares and cubes, but you probably use a calculator like I did, you will get 2.8. 362, which is kind of close to 2.5, but not extremely close. Um, and f at 1.01, 1.05 is 2.832275. So that 2.84 is actually pretty close. Um, and it's not surprising that this is a better approximation than the other one because we used a point xy that was closer to ab. Um, the point of linear approximation isn't that it's a great, great approximation. It's that it's very simple and it's a good approximation, the best affine linear approximation. 
And as x and y gets closer and closer to AB, the approximation should get better. Or if, as x and y gets arbitrarily close to AB, the approximation should get arbitrarily um, precise or arbitrarily accurate. OK. Um, what else do we want to do with this? Well, we give a name to this affine linear function that appears on the right here. Um, this is the linearization, so this is the linearization of f at 1, 1. The notation for it, well, it's a little cumbersome because we want to include the function f where we did the linearization and then that this turns out to be a function of x and y, so notation for it L for linearization sub f at the point x, y. So it's a function of x and y, but you've calculated the linearization at 1, 1. So yuck. Um, but still, this is the completely, this notation includes the f and where you've done the linearization on, that's a semicolon. On the other hand, if f is clear, so like in this problem, and you've clearly specified the point at which you're calculating it, Frequently, you just write L of x, y for the linearization, which is a lot less ugly. Um, and we do this in general, not just for functions of two variables, but the affine linear function that appears, so a linear approximation, so that f of x is approximately f of p plus well, the gradient of f at p dotted with x minus p. This is the linearization of f at p. This nice affine linear function. And yeah, what linear approximation says in this form is that f of x, well, I won't write it again. It says that if x is close to p, then f of x should be close to its linearization at p. All right. Um, let's look at another example using our linearization notation or terminology. So it's an example. We'll use more variables just for kicks. Example, so let's let g of x1, x2, x3, x4 equal x2 e to the x1 plus x3 cosine of 2 pi x sub 4 we want to find the linearization L sub g of x at the point 0, 1, minus 2, 1, and use it to approximate G at 0 0 0.01, 1.02, 1 minus 2.005, 0 0.99. 0 All right. This is our problem. Um, yeah, so I, we have four variables, um, a more complicated function. It's got exponentials and cosines in it. We want to find the linearization. And we want to use it to approximate g at this point, which is close to where we calculate the linearization. You know, 0 0.01 is close to 0, 1.02 is close to 1, minus 2.005 is close to minus 2, and 0.99 is close to 1. All right. So <clears throat> what do we have to do? Well, first of all, our function name is g. But so we have to do 
this. So we need, we need to find the linearization. The P for us is the point 0, 1, minus 2, 1. So it means we need the gradient vector of G, so all the partial derivatives of G, evaluated at our point, which I should write up there, um, and I will. And then you dot with the x vector minus the p's, and you add a g of p. So let me rewrite what g is and put our point up here so we won't forget. So g of x1, x2, x3, x4 is x2 e to the x1. plus x3 cosine of 2 pi x4. And our point P, at which we're calculating the linearization, is 0, 1, minus, minus 2, 1. All right. So we need to calculate g at the point, and we need to calculate the gradient vector of g at the point p to find the linearization. Okay, so g at 0, 1, minus 2, 1. Okay. x sub 2 is 1. x sub 1 is 0 x sub 3 is minus 2, and x sub 4 is 1. So we get, this is 1 times 1, so that's 1, and then minus 2 times cosine of 2 pi, same as the cosine of 0, it's 1. So minus 2 times 1, so that is minus 1. All right. The gradient vector of g evaluated p. So we need all the partial derivatives of g. So let's just to mix up our notation. Let's partial of g with respect to x1. All right. We get x2 e to the x1, and then a 0 from this part. The partial of g with respect to x2, uh, we get an e to the x1, and then nothing from this part. The partial of g with respect to x3, we just pick up the cosine of 2 pi x4. And the only one that's slightly difficult, the partial of g with respect to x4, uh, you get 0 here. The x3 is a constant. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, so you get a minus sine of 2 pi x4, but then by the chain rule, you have to multiply times the partial derivative of this inside stuff with respect to x4, and you pick up an extra 2 pi from that. So we get minus 2 pi x3, minus 2 pi x3, times the sine of 2 pi x4. All right, those are the partial derivatives. So what's the gradient vector of g at the point 0, 1, minus 2, 1? It's the vector of partial derivatives evaluated at this point. So we just have to plug in x1 is 0, x2 is 1, x3 is minus 2, and x4 is 1. All right, let me put some more serious divisions between these partial derivatives. All right, so... <clears throat> The partial derivative of g with respect to x1 when x x2 is 1 and x1 is 0, we get 1 times 1. So we just get 1 for the partial with respect to x1. For the partial derivative with respect to x2, x1 is 0, so we get e to the 0. That's 1. The partial derivative with respect to x3, all we need to know is x4. x4 is 1. So we get the cosine of 2 pi times 1. Uh, so that's the cosine of 2 pi, which is also 1. And then finally, we get this. Um, 
So minus 2 pi x3 times the sine of 2 pi x4. But x4 is 1, and the sine of 2 pi is 0. So even though this part isn't 0, we get this part 0. So this last partial derivative is 0. So there's our gradient vector of g at the point. So what do you get for the linearization? So I'll just write, our function is clear, and our point, 0, 1, minus 2, 1, is clear. So I'm just going to write L. But we get L of x1, x2, x3, x4. Maybe I'll just write L of the vector x. All right. I'll underline it since we're thinking of it as a point. Um, the linearization is just um, g, at, g at our point P plus the gradient vector of g at the point P dotted with x minus p. And we calculated these things. By the way, this isn't an approximation. This is the linearization. The approximation is that the original function g is approximately equal to this when x is close to p. So we get L of x equals, we found g at our point p was minus 1. We found the gradient vector at our point p was 1, 1, 1, 0. Remember, this should be a vector of constants. The, it's the fundamental mistake that people make. They leave variables in there. You're evaluating this gradient at the point where you're calculating the linearization. It should be all numbers dotted with the vector of x's minus the point p. So it's a vector one. The vector looks the same, but since we're subtracting things as a vector, it's that. If you want to write this out, this is, if you want to expand this dot product, this is minus 1 plus 1 times, there'd be x1 minus 0, so 1 times x1 minus 0, plus 1 times x2 minus 1, plus 1 times x3 minus negative 2, and then plus 0 times, I'll write it, but I'll simplify this quickly, but 0 times x4 minus 1. So, as I've said, you don't want to expand the things in parentheses, but you don't really, you don't need to write the minus 0, and you certainly don't need to write the 0 here. So we get L of x is minus 1 plus x1 plus x2 minus, plus x2 minus 1 plus x3 plus 2, and that's it. L of x. So if we now want to approximate, I've erased where we want to approximate this. It was at, if we now want to approximate g at 0 0.01, 1.02, minus 2.005, Zero point nine nine. You get that this is approximately um, all right. You get minus one plus x one is zero point zero one. <clears throat> x two minus one. X two minus one is zero point zero two. Um, and then x3 plus 2 is negative 0 0.0005. Uh, so what do we end up with? We end up with something very close to minus 1. We get a minus, so you get, um, well, you get minus 1.0005 plus... 0 0.03, so you end up with negative uh, 0 0.97, actually this doesn't look 
quite. Right. Uh, I think I'm. Ah, no, I, I'm just off by a, mm, looking at a, a zero slightly wrong. Uh, negative zero point. No, nine zero. <laughs> Seven. Uh, no, this is. Wow. You get. Actually, something looks like it's off to me because I'm getting, well, nine zero seven negative nine negative point nine seven five. Um, that looks like it's off by a decimal place to me. Did I add a decimal place in my, yes. I see that I meant, and I probably changed it, I was wondering why this didn't agree with my memory. That should have been that. That should have been that. And now I'm happy. OK, sorry. That's why I had those sheets with me. All right, yes, I had changed what I wrote there from before. Good, good. Now it agrees with my memory. All right. Um, OK, so that's linear approximation. Um, I would like to do, would like to write this slightly differently before I leave this example. Um, so, how could you do this slightly differently? Well, it's not really different, but we could have calculated this kind of separately before writing out this. Is this a significant difference? No, but it helps break things up into kind of nice pieces sometimes so that we just could have up here had, when we were plugging in the vector 0. 0, 1, 1 0.02. It's just doing it in vector notation um, first. Could have had this minus the, the point where we were doing the linearization. 0, 1 minus 2, 1. And then just had, it's not like this is giving us anything different. It's just you group that together before you ever expand it in variables. So, but this is the linearization calculated exactly at the point we're interested in, not the linearization in general. Well, let me just not call it anything. You get that this, that g at the point we're interested in, is approximately this. And then you would write 1, 1, 1, 0 dotted with. And then you just subtract these vectors, 0 0.01, um, 0 0.02. You're subtracting this, which means adding 2. So you get negative 0 0.005. And then negative 0 negative 0 0.01. And then you do the dot product. Of course, you get exactly the same thing. It's just a question of whether you expand it in terms of the x's first, and then plug in the point that you care about, or plug in the point you care about, do this difference, and then do the dot product. It's, uh, uh, frequently, when you've got lots of coordinates, it looks better to do this vector operation separately um, I mean, first. OK. Um, that's that example. Um, what does this have to do with tangent planes or tangent spaces or tangent sets? Well, the graph in, in single variable calculus, the graph of the linearization gave you the tangent line. So, um, in multivariable calculus, let's start with a function of two variables, but if you get f equals f of x, y, and point P is a, b, then the linearization of f looks as a function of x and y is f at a, b, 
plus the partial derivative of f with respect to x at a, b, times x minus a, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y at a, b, times y minus b. Um, this is a nice affine linear function. Its graph, the graph of this, is a plane. And because this is the best affine linear function that approximates f well near a, b, this is the best plane that approximates the graph of f well near the point with x and y coordinates, near the point on the graph that has x and y coordinates, a and b. So this gives us a reasonable notion of the tangent plane. The graph of this is a plane. The tangent plane, well, this is the tangent plane by definition. to the graph of f at the point. And now you usually give the point as a point in three dimensions. Um, so its x and y coordinates are a and b, and its z coordinate is just f of a, b. More generally, and I don't tend to look at an example of this, but more generally, the graph of, so suppose you've got the linearization of a function of any number of variables. So let me, maybe I'll call it g now, thinking of g as g could be a function of any number of variables. The graph of If you take the linearization of a function g of any number of variables at a point p at which g is differentiable, and you graph that, then the graph of this is the tangent set. Of course, we call it a plane if it's in two dimensions. I mean, when it's this two-dimensional thing, is the tangent set to the graph of f. But a big part of the point of the tangent lines in single variable calculus and tangent planes and multivariable calculus is to help you picture part of what's going on in calculus. That's a big part of the point. And so if you have a, a function of more than two variables, so the graph lies in more than three dimensions, you're not going to be able to picture the tangent set. So it's a, you can still talk about it mathematically but it's not really going to help you picture what's going on. Uh, the graph is the tangent set to the graph of g at the point x, uh, at the point p, uh, g of p. All right, but, but we can certainly look at examples of the of the tangent plane. So let's look at the tangent plane, not for this function. Let's go back to our easier function that we already looked at. Let's go back to our easier function that we looked at. We looked at Um, f of x, so let's look at z equals f of x, y equals 4 plus x minus x squared minus y cubed. Okay, um, we found, so let's uh, look at that um, at Consider this. Near or at. Um, we 
looked where x was 1 and y was 1, and then we found that, um, consider this, that, all right, x, y equals 1, 1. All right. The graph of this, this is, the graph of this is not a quadric surface, which we looked at earlier because of that cubic thing. Uh, you can have graphing software draw for it. I'm just going to try to draw a generic picture. My pictures by hand are never, are rarely awesome. Um, but I'm just trying to give you the flavor of what you'll see if you use graphing software to look at this. It's, of course, a lot of it depends on your scales and lots of other things. But what I'm trying to draw for you is a, it's a possible graph of z equals f of x, y. And um, so we want to look where x and y is 1 and 1. We need the z coordinate. We found this before. f of, <clears throat> f of 1, 1 is 3, because right? 1 and 1, those cancel out, and then you get 4 minus 1. So that's 3. We also found the gradient vector before. That's really easy to recalculate, because f of x is 1 minus 2x, and f of y is minus 3y squared. So um, the partial of f with respect to x at 1, 1 is minus 1, and the partial of f with respect to y at 1, 1 is minus 3. We, we just did this a few minutes ago, but that's a reminder. So what we get for the linearization, I'll just write L of xy, or what we got, we just didn't, was 3 minus minus 1 times x minus 1, minus 3 times y minus 1. That's the linearization at 1, at 1, 1. And the graph of that is the tangent plane to the graph at 1, 1, at, well, 1, 1, z coordinate 3. So whether you think it looks like it or not in my picture, I'm going to draw it right there because it's kind of easiest for me to draw tangent plane on the edge like that. So let's pretend that's the point 1, 1, 3. So actually, I'll, so 1, 1, 3. And the tangent plane. Now it's the best, the best plane that approximates the surface well there, and it'll be something that just glances off of the graph. So I'll draw it like that. In the book, of course, there's a computer-drawn picture. But the tangent plane, you should imagine something just glancing off the graph of the, of the surface. Um, all right. Why should you believe that's a reasonable notion of tangent plane? Well, for one thing, it's the graph of the linearization. And that's exactly how we define the tangent line in calculus one as the graph of the linearization. We might not have used those words for the first time, but that's what we did. There is another reason. It's not terribly complicated, but takes a, a little explanation. If this is a reasonable notion of the tangent plane, then if we take cross sections, take an x cross section here, take a y cross section and get a curve, then you would hope if this is a reasonable notion of the tangent plane, then if we take cross sections and get curves, when we take a cross section of this surface, you'll get a curve, that if we take the corresponding cross-section of the, of the plane, we get the tangent line to that curve we get for the cross-section. So is that true? And the answer is, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it this way. But so my point is that that tangent plane is the only plane containing the tangent lines to the two cross sections. So if you wanted a plane, that property, that's the one it has to be. So how do you see this? Well, let's at least see that it, when we take an x cross section, um, we, we get the tangent line to that curve um, in that plane. And then we'll just believe that the analogous thing happens for the y cross section. So we've got z equals f of xy equals 4 plus x minus x squared minus y cubed. 
On the other hand, we've got its linearization. Z equals L of X, Y is 3 minus X minus 1 minus 3 times Y minus 1. Let's look at, take the X cross section. What I mean, the, I mean the one that passes through the point that we're interested in, 1, 1, 3. So the x cross section, so you fix an x value and at 1, 1, 3. Well, the x value is 1. So take the x cross section, x equals 1. So if you look at this, and you only look at it where x, when x is restricted to being 1, you get 4 plus 1 minus 1, uh, minus 1 minus y cubed. So you get 4 minus y cubed. If you want to give this function of one variable a name, you, know, you could call it h of y temporarily. So when you take the x cross section at x equals 1, you get this function of just y, which I'll call h of y, or you know, it's f of 1y. But then um, what do you get if you take the cross section of this plane? Well, you get an equation for a line um, in terms of x and y, in terms of z and y. Um, you will get z equals 3 if x is fixed at 1, that part is 0, minus 3 times y minus 1. This describes right, the, the line you get by taking the tangent plane and intersecting it with another plane, x equals 1. You get this line. Really, it take, remember, it takes two equations, two of these rectangular Euclidean equations to give you a line in space. Well, one of them is x equals 1, and the other one's this. Or you can think of the line as z equals 3 minus 3 times y minus 1 inside the, the copy of the yz plane that's x minus 1. So the claim, my claim is that Yes, the, the corresponding cross-section of the tangent plane gives you the tangent line to the cross-section of the graph. So I'm claiming that this gives you an equation for the tangent line to that. So now this is a one-variable calculus problem. What's an equation for the tangent line to this at the point? Now we just have y's and z's coordinate, y and z coordinates left. So find, or the claim, Um, the tangent line to the graph of h at um, y z equals one three is exactly is given by this. Right? The whole point here is that if you take the cross section of the surface and get a curve, then the tangent line to that curve is exactly the same as what you get if you take the cross section of the tangent plane. Um, so that the tangent plane contains the tangent lines to the cross sections. Um, well, how do you, you can just see this, it's, um, the, how would you calculate the tan, an equation for the tangent line to this? You take, it's, you take the slope, so you evaluate, you get um, an equation for the tangent line in terms of z and y, you take h at the y coordinate you've got, plus h prime at the y coordinate you've got, times um, y minus the y coordinate you've got. This is from Calc 1. You're calculating, finding an equation for the tangent line to the graph of h at the point where y is 1. So you calculate this, but you know, h was just where we fixed the value of, of x. 
So this derivative of h is the partial derivative of f with respect to y, but we can just calculate it again. h at 1, of course, is 3. h prime at 1, h prime is minus 3y squared evaluated at 1, so it's minus 3 times y minus 1. Yes, of course we get this equation that we got from, from slicing the linearization. Um, because that's exactly how you get the linearization. If you set x equal to 1, this is the partial derivative of our original f with respect to y, evaluated at 1, 1. Well, we fixed x at 1. We calculated the derivative of h at 1. That's just exactly the same as the partial derivative of f with respect to y, evaluated at 1, 1. So, of course, you get the same thing. So, that was just an explanation of why this is a very reasonable notion of the tangent plane. Um, later, um, in later sections, we'll also see that the tangent plane consists of, the, of a plane of tangent vectors, but we'll get to that. Um, there is one more thing I want to talk about related to linear approximation. And it, it's really... <laughs> It's really just linear approximation written in a slightly different form, and yet some problems are phrased in such a way that this is the form that you want to look at linear approximation in. So linear approximation for us says if x is close to p, Yeah, it says f of x is close to its linearization at p. But I'm going to rewrite, I'm going to not use linearization terminology right now. It, it says that. Um, this is one way that I wrote linear approximation earlier. Well, we could give a name to this. This is, you're looking at x is close to p. And so this is some change in x vector. p is one of the x's. It's a specific x at which we're calculating things. But write this as delta, so for the change in the x vector. And then subtract f of p from both sides. And then this is the corresponding change in f. And then you immediately get that linear approximation just says that the change in f is approximately the total derivative of f evaluated on the change in x, the change in x vector. And then, of course, you can say to calculate this, you take the gradient of f at p dotted with the change in x vector. Now, this is just linear approximation, except stated in terms of change of. If you've got, if the change in x vector is small and your x's are near p, then if you take the gradient of f at p dotted with this change in x vector, you get an approximation of the change in f. That's linear approximation in its kind of change in form. And in this form, this is referred to as differential approximation. And the, the term differential actually refers to the fact that uh, some people refer to this total derivative as the differential. You can read more about that terminology and exactly how it's written in more fancy ways in the textbook, but I'm just going to leave it like this. This is called differential approximation. I just want to do two examples of this, and then we'll be finished with this section. So um, an example of differential approximation So 
example. So how would you phrase something in terms of this? Well, one way would be, suppose h of x, y, z is 2z times the natural log of e plus x, y. Then h at 0 minus 2, 5, well, you can calculate it. If x is 0, this part is 0, you get the natural log of e, that's 1. And then you get 2 times 5, so it's 10. OK, what's the question? Approximate. the change in h, so delta h, if delta of x, y, z is 0 0.01, 0 0.05, negative 0 0.2. <coughs> All right, uh, what is this? This is the point P at which we calculate the gradient vector. So different, because this is phrased in change in, as the change in, we want to use differential approximation, which says the approximate change, the change in H is approximately the gradient of H evaluated at some kind of nice point. You're kind of thinking of your starting point from which you're talking about change, dotted with the change in the x vector. So, but our x vector is actually three coordinates x, y, and z. So I'm just going to change in x, y, z. Well, we're given the change in x, y, z. It's this. So that'll go here. We need the gradient of h. Well, we can calculate the gradient vector of h at any point. What do we use for the point p? Well, that's why I gave you this information. p, the point at which you're supposed to think that you're starting at is 0 minus 2, 5. So that's all we do. We need to calculate the gradient vector of h at the point 0 minus 2, 5. So you calculate the gradient vector of h. We need its partial derivatives. The partial of h with res partial derivative of h with respect to x. You get the 2z. And then times you get 1 over e plus xy. But then by the chain rule, we're taking partial derivatives with respect to x. You have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff with respect to x. So you pick up an extra times y. So we get this, partial of h with respect to x. Partial derivative of h with respect to y looks the same, except you get a 2z. You get the 1 over e plus xy. But then when you take the partial derivative of the inside stuff, with respect to y, you pick up a times x. And then finally, the partial of h with respect to z, uh, you just get 2 times the natural log of e plus xy. We need this gradient vector calculated, or the vector that we get by taking these partial derivatives, at the point 0 minus 2, 5. So um, the gradient vector of h at 0 minus 2, 5, well, we get our three partial derivatives evaluated at when x is 0, um, y is minus 2, and z is 5. So looking back at what we did, you get 10 times uh, y is minus 2 minus 2 over e, comma, and then you get 10 times, and then the x coordinate is 0, so you just get 0. And then you get, for the last one, you get 2. So we get minus 20 over e, 0. 
And so the approximate change in h, it's our gradient vector, minus 20 over e, 0, 2, dotted with our, with our change in the variables vector, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. 0, 0.5 and negative 0, 0.2 and this is well this divides by 100 so we get negative 0.2 over e uh, plus 0 then minus 0, 0.4 um, and then there's a slightly annoying thing if you want to write this as a decimal you'd probably go to a calculator like I would um, and if you're going to do that, you probably wonder why you would bother, why you would bother doing this <laughs> by linear approximation if you're going to do it, or differential approximation if you're going to use a calculator anyway. So you could leave your answer like this, but if you want to know what this is as far as a calculator is concerned, this is minus 0.4735. 75888, and there's some more. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's a, a first example of differential approximation. Uh, I want to do one more, kind of a more applied example, and then we'll be finished with this section. So suppose, so more of a word problem with differential approximation. So suppose, suppose you've got a right circular cylinder. So that's what you normally think of as a cylinder, right? The sides are at right angles to the base. Circular means the cross sections are circles. I'm going to say of radius r and height h. Um, suppose you have a right circular cylinder of radius point 0.5 feet. and height one foot. If you increase the radius by a tenth of a foot and decrease the height, by a tenth of a foot. What is the approximate change in the volume? So there's the problem, a more applied problem, more of a word, pro a word problem. But don't let that scare you. The, there is one thing you have to know to get started on this. You, you have to know a formula for the volume of a right circular cylinder in terms of the radius and the height. If you don't know that, you really can't get anywhere. That's just the area of the base times the height. The area of the base is it's a circular radius r, so pi times radius squared times the height. So there's the volume um, and as a function of the radius and the height. All we're going to use is that the change in the volume is approximately, we're going to use differential approximation. The change in the volume is approximately 
the gradient vector of the volume at our fixed point. What fixed point? Well, our original point. So you can think starting point if you don't like fixed point. At, we're thinking of V as we're thinking of V as having R first and H second. Um, so it's at 0.51. And then we dot with the change in the RH vector. And we're given that, but you have to be slightly careful. Delta of RH. The radius increases by a foot. I'm dropping all the units, but in the end, our volume will be, our change in the volume will be in cubic feet. So um, change in RH, we're told that R increases by one foot, uh, 0.1 feet. But you have to be a little careful. You're told that the height decreases by 0.1 feet. That means the change in vector is negative. The change in H is negative 0.1. And so all we have to do is calculate this gradient vector of the volume at 0.51 and then dot it with this vector, and that'll give us the approximate change in the volume. Uh, we have to calculate the gradient vector of V, which, so the gradient vector of V at 0.51. This is um, the partial of V with respect to R, comma the partial of V with respect to H, evaluated at 0.51. Uh, the partial derivative with respect to R is 2 pi RH. The partial derivative with respect to H is pi R squared. We want to evaluate this at 0.51. So we're putting in R is 0.5 and h is 1 in this gradient vector calculation. So um, you get just pi, because you get 2 times pi and then times 0.5 times 1, so 0.5 times 2, 1, so you get pi. And then pi times 0.5 squared, so we get 0.25 pi. You can factor out a pi if you want. It hardly matters. Um, so what you get is that this is pi, or the change in v is approximately pi times 0 0.25 pi dotted with 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1. So this is 0 0.1 times pi minus um, 0 0.025 times so we get um, 0 0.075 pi cubic feet. So that's our approximation for, for the change in the volume. Um, okay. Um, that's that's the, the end of at least this, uh, the basic part of linear approximation and tangent planes. Um, it's, uh, it should remind you of what you did in Calc 1 for tangent lines and linear approximation there. Um, in later sections, we will go on about and say more about the tangent plane. And if you want to know more about kind of differential notation and terminology, you need to read the, the more depth section, uh, the more depth part of this section.